at James and uh, kind of acclimate you uh, to where we've been. If you're just joining us, uh, we've been looking through the uh, book of James, which has been eye-opening for me and just my own personal studies. Because uh, I, I found that when we begin to deal with, with this letter, uh, we're dealing with a church that is an early church um, in which is experienced, you're under the impression, a period of stagnation. And I assume that um, churches go through that. And, and the early church was going through this. Um, James, who is the half-brother of Jesus, has assumed leadership uh, after Pentecost at some point, And of the global church, uh, we see this in several different passages where Paul, for example, comes down to Jerusalem and he'll, he writes in his letters, the first person he meets with is James. And so this guy here who's writing this letter has just tremendous leadership in the early church. He's not only pastoring, arguably, the largest and most influential church on the face of the planet, but God has given him the position uh, to address, the, a position of authority to address the global church. Um, it's a little different. See, we have, we have a global voice in our day, and I've talked about this some before, but we have a global voice in our day, but not, and, and he didn't have the kind of technology that we had. But the global voice that he had was given to him and recognized. It was recognized. His authority was recognized. So he has been granted not just the position, but it's been recognized. That's the idea of ordination, by the way. If you ever have a question about what it means to be an ordained elder, an ordained elder is a body of believers. You know, anybody can come in and say, I'm a prophet. You know? and we've had that at our church before. Guys come in and say, I'm a prophet. Let me prophesy. We're like, uh, no. <laughs> you know, I'm called by God. What ordination is, the body recognizes and affirms that call and it gives you a place to practice. Gives you, and practice is probably not the right, the right word, but gives you practice in terms of, of the administration of that gift. That's James. They gave him, he not only exercises authority to address the body, but they gave him the platform of that. So it's just this tremendous document that we have. Uh, this anointed document that we have addressing the early church. Uh, if you were to divide up the, the letter, it's, it's, a, it's fairly easy to divide up. The first half, the first uh, chapter of his letter is dealing with laying out the message. And I've been talking about this in several ways. What, to reiterate quickly, uh, what we talked about thus far is the message of the gospel is not contractual, it's relational. Are you with me? This is so, so significant. It's not contractual, it's relational. And it, it would appear, and we'll get to some of this tonight, so I'm not going to go too deep into this. But it would appear, it would appear that the way at times we talk about Christianity, or the way I hear Christianity talked about, it's it's contractual. You know, you meet people you haven't seen in a while, and you wonder how they're doing. They've kind of been absent from church, or you know, whatever, whatever. How you doing? Oh, I'm doing, I'm doing well. You know, I'm not drinking. Well, that's that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Well, I have the new drugs. Yeah, well, that's great, too. You know, Oprah would be pleased. Um, you know, well, and, uh, you know, and, and that point, see, I'm, I'm talking about you and him. How tight are you with him? This, and this is what he's talking about. Some other language we've been getting into, which is super significant, is a coming in agreement with him. Um, contractual relationships with God don't bring deliverance. They just don't. Um, and, and we mentioned this briefly earlier, but when I come into a right relationship with God and walk out of bondage, oftentimes you will find, find folks, and if you've been around church you see this, they get wrapped right back up into bondage again. And, and what ends up happening is they, they're like, they have this mentality of they agree in, 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 you know, in Jesus, it's wrong, and it's not like they walk out and change their mind. They just walk away from Jesus. Not realizing that their only hope of salvation is being intimate with Him. But the only shot I have of freedom is just never get out of this embrace. You ever get out of this embrace, you're shocked. So it's not just believing the right things. So I come out of agreement with the enemy and say, hey, I, I, I'm not going to think this way. I'm not going to embrace this, this line of thought. I'm not going to embrace this lifestyle. I know that this substance is not going to meet needs in my life. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break the enemy with uh, break the agreement with the enemy. And Jesus, I want to come in agreement with you. I want, I want to 
think the way you think and feel the way you feel. And I want to live in this embrace with you for the rest of my life. And in that embrace, I have freedom. One of the things we looked at, we taught some classes today um, in, in the school. And there are three prepositions that are really common in, throughout the New Testament. Ain, ace, and ek. So they're really easy to remember. Ain, ace, and ek. In the earlier letters in the New Testament, uh, you have ain used a lot, which is translated in, to talk about a relationship with God. When you get saved, you are in Christ. Okay? You, you, you are in Him. He is in you. And the word ain describes that I'm in this barrier of Christ. That began to, tr that began to change as the New Testament, later New Testament letters, and especially in Paul's letters, they begin to be more, more developed. Aim wasn't used, and ace is used. And ace means into. It's not just inside, but it's into. And when we're talking about Christianity, to say I'm in Christ is one thing. But to say that Christ has come into me is stronger. Because what that means is that as a Christian, it, it's, it's clarifying that another being, God himself, has taken residence inside of my body. And ek means out of. So he is ace and has not ek in my life. So I'm not just inhabited by God, but he has invaded my life. That that. It, in the first chapter, in a nutshell, that's what James is talking about. It's not a belief system. It's not a set of morals. You can be an extremely moral individual and not a Christian. We're talking about a, an intimate, an intimate embrace lifestyle with another person, Jesus Christ. That's the first chapter. When you get into the second chapter, we've been dealing with and some of this is already becoming old material, but we've been dealing with um, the second main issue. The first issue, as we looked at last year, was favoritism. And we dealt with that. It's ended up being kind of a platform by which he talks about the rest. The second issue is bridged with that, and it's the issue of religion. And you have, under the, you're under the impression, because this is the audience that he's talking to, that there's a number of people that have come out of Judaism that are wrapped up in an old covenant relationship with God. That's no longer an option. And in fact, it's no longer not a, a, an option. It doesn't exist. You cannot serve God in an old covenant relationship. There is no God in a temple in Jerusalem anymore. You are that temple. Isn't that aggressive? But it's true. There's no value in any of that anymore. Christ has replaced every bit of it. And so you, he's dealing with this group of people. This is the church at this time is almost exclusively Jewish. And so James is writing to a group of people that aren't bad, they aren't evil, they believe absolutely. They're probably not even living immoral lifestyles. They're just missing the whole part of Christianity. And that's so bizarre. When, when, in talking to some of the teens today, when you, when you, when you share with them, their eyes crinkle. You know, their nose wrinkles, and they're looking at you like, what are you talking about? Because oftentimes, that's, and I've got sucked into this, we raise our kids to don't drink, don't lie, don't steal, go to church. And all that stuff is great, but, man, you can be doing all that stuff and miss, miss him. And he's the motivating factor in all the things that we do. So when you get wrapped up in Jesus, all of those things are going to take place anyway. So that's, that's kind of what we've been dealing with. Now, where we've been at the last few nights is looking at this picture of Abraham. And uh, <laughs> I wasn't going to come clean, but I want to come clean. There are certain studies, and I, I don't know if you've ever presented in front of a group of people before, but there are certain studies you share, and then you just don't share them again. <laughs> and there's a variety of reasons for that. 